We're all paying attention to the outbreak of the highly contagious coronavirus that has appeared in China. In the early days of global spread of this disease, a CDC official warned, quote, We're asking the American public to work with us to prepare in the expectation that this could be bad. In 2009, we were worried about a swine flu pandemic. We created a video back then, especially for residential institutions. Dr. Tom Army had responsibility then for the safety of students at a boarding school. On this video, he talks about how to go about protecting your family from a viral pandemic. Then he was talking about the flu, but his advice has relevance for the coronavirus as we begin to prepare. As we learn more about this new viral outbreak, you can easily make appropriate adjustments to your preparations. But what he has to say will get your preparation started on the right track. Here's what he said a decade ago. Let's get down to the practical stuff. Step number one in our plan is to define in your home or living space a perimeter that will enclose your virus-free living area. You will need to lock all the doors except one along that perimeter as soon as a pandemic flu virus comes within your local community. The single door into your virus-free perimeter must have a sheltered space outside of it that you will make into your decontamination area. An enclosed porch, a hall with a door, a garage, or a mudroom could serve as this decontamination area. In your decontamination room, you need a place to hang a raincoat. They are impervious to droplets, hat, and a mask for every member of your family who will need to come in and go out. You need a table or a bench to store or decontaminate items. In addition, you need a place to hide or secure cash outside of your perimeter. Let's talk more about all of these elements. When you leave your virus-free perimeter, you need to wear an outside layer of clothing that will stay outside when you return home. If you're simply running an errand, you will need to keep your protective outfit on for the duration of the errand. If you're going to some other location that also has a virus-free area, you would remove your protective clothing as if you were returning to your own home. Ideally, you should have separate inside and outside footwear. When you return home, you must consider that outside layer of clothing to be contaminated with the virus, so it must stay outside your perimeter, unless it's going straight into the washing machine. Items headed for the washing machine should go into a bag kept in the decontamination room that is either disposable or, better yet, a cloth bag that can go right into the wash along with the items it contains. An N95 mask, the N stands for NIOSH, will form a key part of your protective clothing. These masks, if applied and used according to the manufacturer's instructions, are designed to capture the droplets of moisture that carry viruses. Read the instructions to find out exactly how to position the mask and its straps to provide the best fit and function. The masks come in sizes to accommodate big faces, medium faces, small faces, even children's faces. You can buy these from many sources, quality pharmacies, medical, hardware, and even construction supply stores. On the web, just Google N95 mask. You may want to purchase a range of types to cover repeat use 
and unexpected needs. The fact that a virus will passively deactivate in about three days when dried out can prove useful when you bring home things you need, but may not need immediately. If you set such items aside to dry in your decontamination area, you can safely bring them inside after three days. If you need to bring items into the house more immediately, you need to decontaminate them. You may hear on the news about exotic viral decontamination agents being used in public buildings, but you don't need these agents at your home. The exotic agents are designed to have residual action against viruses. Uh, this is to say that they keep on deactivating viruses for days. Agents that do that all have some level of toxicity for people. So we think you need to use safer agents at home and give up on the residual killing, or more correctly, residual deactivation. Lysol sprays work well. You can safely spray or wipe items with rubbing alcohol and effectively kill viruses. You can also use Clorox bleach diluted one part bleach to nine parts water. When using bleach, you need to provide some ventilation. Remember to decontaminate doorknobs, handles, and spigots often. Purell and other no water hand sanitizers are effective in this application. Also, washing with soap and water works well, as does high heat such as cooking and boiling. Washing and cooking obviously apply most naturally to decontamination of fresh foods. It should be obvious that bringing home prepared foods or takeout foods is not a safe option. Canned foods are safe. Frozen foods that you cook are safe. But in all cases, you may need to decontaminate the packaging when you bring it home. Despite recommendations often put forward to the public, it is difficult to conceptualize acquiring and having room to store a safe supply of food for as much as six months. Your mail must be decontaminated. I'm talking about M A. I L, not M A L E. You can read it wearing your mask and gloves and never take it inside your virus free perimeter. You can wait four days to read it or you can decontaminate it and take it inside. But don't even think about microwaving your mail. The post office found that microwaves often skipped areas and didn't do a reliable job of decontamination. Cooking food in a microwave constitutes a very different process since the water in food conducts the heat to all portions of the food. Cooking food works fine to get rid of viruses, but microwaves do not work when it comes to your mail. It is very easy to forget about cash, credit cards, receipts, keys, and even pens that can be contaminated and brought without thinking inside your perimeter. You might consider keeping pocket items in a Ziploc bag that stays outside your safe area. But bills or paper money have unique dangers. Researchers have found that a virus can remain active for a prolonged period of time, protected from light and air, in a stack of cash. Think weeks. So folding money or bills can prove a deadly source of contamination during a flu pandemic. Okay, so now let's imagine that you've gone out into the flu contaminated world to run an errand in your coat, your hat, and your mask. You're now back home. When you return home, you must consider your face, hands, they're likely to have been contaminated. 
and everything that you touch before washing your hands vigorously with soap and water can then also be contaminated. So you have to think about doorknobs and water spigots and towels. You probably want to consider having a large supply of paper towels. You can use non-disposable towels, but they need to go into the laundry after each use. A virus cannot move about by itself, but contaminated objects can contaminate everything they touch. You see, I'm trying to get you to think as if you're working in a surgical operating room where nurses and doctors have elaborate rituals to make sure that nothing contaminated can touch something that must remain sterile. Anything you bring inside your perimeter that you have not decontaminated can transmit virus to everything inside. We've known for centuries that fingers are the most dangerous sources of disease spread. We also know that gatherings of people are the best way to spread a flu virus that attacks the human lungs. At the first warning of a flu pandemic, you may see schools closing down, church services put on hold, and all forms of group gatherings outlawed. Businesses that depend on face-to-face -face interactions will close or find new ways to operate. Obviously, you can always talk safely on the phone, send emails, and gather news from the internet, radio, and television. We are fortunate to have so many modern tools to communicate and to interact with families and friends that would not spread a flu virus during a pandemic. During a flu pandemic, the government may but probably will not limit travel. Air travel creates special problems because the air in aircraft is recirculated to conserve fuel and despite the filters used on commercial aircraft, continuous movement of air inside the cabin can easily spread a virus to everyone aboard. Some aircraft are worse in this regard than others but none are safe. To be effective in preventing spread, over 95% of travel would have to be curtailed. Such a drastic travel restriction would prove an economic disaster, and society is not likely to adopt such a ban widely enough to make any difference. But you and your family can elect to avoid travel. Every occupation will need specific analysis of its risks and safeguards. Use the principles you've learned here to think about your work area. Your pet has the potential for bringing a virus into your virus-free area if someone has done a little petting or even sneeze nearby while your pet was out for a walk. Keep Sophie on a leash and well away from both people and other dogs. Cats should either be kept indoors or prevented from coming and going. It may become necessary, for example, for outsiders to come inside your virus-free living area, perhaps even quickly. You must use the principles here to decontaminate after such an event or perhaps even to decontaminate the visitor in order to protect your family's virus-free space. You may want to keep a spare coat, hat, and mask in your decontamination room to dress a visitor who needs to enter your living space. In this case, you are dressing the visitor to contain any virus they may have from spreading to your virus-free space. Ideally, the visitor would wear gloves while in your living space. Suppose something happens that makes you think you or another member of your family may have been exposed to the flu. What do you do? We recommend 
that you temporarily create a new and separate perimeter just for that person. In other words, you send the potentially infected person off to stay in their own bedroom and declare that room temporarily outside of the perimeter for everyone else in the household. You treat transfers of food and other items in and out of that room as a perimeter crossing that requires decontamination. In that case, everyone within the primary perimeter needs a mask and protective clothing to go inside the separated room. The isolation of an exposed family member needs to continue for the incubation period of the virus. This set of new behaviors will constitute a big change in your life, but it is the best bet you have for protecting both your life and the lives of everyone in your living group.